the need for interpretation. So this is, yeah, the first class or one we will be taking um, of eight weeks is our plan uh, of how to read the Bible. So a lot of this course uh, for me was designed out of a book called uh, The Introduction to Biblical Interpretation. Um, pretty heavy textbook of mine for seminary, but uh, yeah, out of that and out of another assignment, I came up with this course and I'm continually building it. Um, I have some course objectives that I have desire for everybody as we take it and we go through it. Um, as we go through this, I would like us to develop, you know, more of a passion for reading and interpreting God's word. Uh, you know, not just simply reading it, but actually wanting to understand it more. Um, another one is to be able to uh, ask, you know, many literary and contextual questions of scripture. Um, you know, meaning that we are, yeah, that we are just asking a lot of questions and that's going to be one of the things uh, I know I struggle with it, even in my own reading, but uh, it's looking for the, seeking out the stuff we don't understand and asking more questions and more questions. Uh, and so as we explore this course, um, you know, maybe there are things that you hadn't have, hadn't thought to look for before, but are there or are part of uh, reading the Bible or part of how it was written that now you can ask some yeah, some questions on the context and how it was even created in a literary structure. Um, and then three is to begin developing a personal hermeneutical method that seeks a correct interpretation of scripture with humility. Um, and that is just creating our own, developing our own way, the way that we will go through and uh, our, the way we interpret it, but also the way that we convey that to others. Um, and doing that with uh, an attitude of humility. So that is our objectives for this, these next few weeks. Um, yeah, so what are we about to learn? Um, well, today we're kind of talking about what is your hermeneutics or what is the need, <coughs> the need for interpretation. Uh, next week, we are going to be diving into the history uh, of interpretation. Um, kind of looking at some of the different methods that interpretation has taken on from ancient Israel, you know, to today. Uh, so we're going to be exploring some of that. We're going to be exploring the Bible, specifically uh, the canon, and how, you know, how did they choose the 66 books that are in our scriptures today? Um, why those books? How did that come to be? Uh, we're going to be looking at, you know, the interpreter, uh, you, uh, myself, you know, what part do do we play, either positively or negatively, as uh, in the task of interpretation, uh, looking at you know who we are, uh, and how that influences our interpretation. Uh, we're going to be looking at you know what is the goal in interpretation. Uh, spend a, a week on that. We're going to be looking at uh, understanding biblical literature, uh, kind of looking at the general rules for prose uh, and poetry and just how uh, actual literary structure look, or takes form. Um, and also we're gonna be looking at uh, understanding biblical genres, um, genres through the o Old Testament and New Testament. Uh, yeah, looking at narrative, uh, epistles, poetry, uh, wisdom. Um, yeah, there's a whole lot of them that we're gonna be looking at. Uh, and then lastly, kind of the fruits of interpretation, you know, how do we use the Bible today uh, and how are we going to apply it to our lives? So with that, what do we need, why do we need to learn this? Uh, first of all, the Bible is God's word to us, his special revelation. Uh, it's not just a human book. It is God breathed. It is authoritative and true. Uh, it's spiritual meaning it can change, it can change lives. It has the power, uh, yeah, it's, it's not just a bunch of words. Uh, it's both unity and diversity. It's, it's communicated uh, to humanity through humanity. And 
you know, as we look at that, uh, you know, it is, you know, unity and diversity. We're looking at many different cultures over history, uh, you know, different people groups as we've gone through, whether it was the Jews in early Israel uh, into more of like, you know, the time of them being in, you know, Hellenistic uh, Judaism, all of it. Yeah. And then we're moving into the Greeks and, uh, and how all of those people actually, you know, make what we have as the scriptures and how it's actually unified. Um, and the Bible is, is un understandable. It's intended to be understood and known by humanity. Um, without an organized approach uh, or means to understanding, uh, we would not be able to comprehend anything. So we need some kind of method. We need to be able to put into practice certain ways that we actually approach scripture so that we can actually comprehend what it is saying. Um, so taking responsibility for your faith, um, I think that's another reason why we're here to learn this. Um, Richard Foster says, uh, human beings seem to have a perpetual tendency to have someone else talk to God for them. Uh, we are content to have the message secondhand. Uh, one of Israel's fatal mistakes was their insistence on having a human king rather than resist rather than resting in the theocratic rule of God over them. Um, I know, yeah, we have a tendency, I think maybe not even so much in the, in the past, but maybe when Christianity was a little bit more prevalent in society, it was just, you know, well, the preacher said it, so it must be true. Um, but we're saying, let's actually take, you know, some of that, uh, responsibility for ourselves and, um, yeah, and actually learn how to interpret scripture ourselves. Uh, as Hebrews 5, 13 to 14 says, anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted uh, with the teaching about righteousness, but solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Um, yeah, so we're here to move away from from milk, which generally, you know, if you're here wanting to learn, your desire is to not be on milk, or maybe you have already passed on from that, but uh, your desire is to be more mature, uh, to actually uh, grow and, and put into these, you, you know, constant use and being trained uh, in righteousness that, yeah, that you would be able to, to interpret scripture. So we need to spend some time asking questions. Uh, and so part of interpretation is, you know, is asking what is this text saying to me and what difference should it make in my life, if any? Uh, it's kind of one of the main questions, uh, but you know, as we're approaching the text, we're gonna be asking a lot of questions. Um, so, some terms to learn, if uh, you guys all heard of hermeneutics, hermeneutics before, yeah? No. Um, hermeneutics simply means correctly understanding the thought of an author and communicating that thought to others. Um, coming, coming from the, the Greek words uh, hermeneo and hermeneia, meaning... Mm -hmm. All good. You get on it. You get on it. I'll talk to him later. Uh, meaning to explain or interpret or translate. Uh, and so we're also going to be looking at uh, this other, uh, these other two things of exegesis and eisegesis. Exegesis meaning, you know, reading the author's original meaning out of the text. Uh, an eisegesis, meaning that we are reading our own meaning into the text. Uh, eisegesis is the process of uh, interpreting text in such a way as to introduce one's own presuppositions, agendas, or biases. Uh, it is commonly referred to as reading into the text, 
Uh, it's often done to prove uh, a pre-held point of concern, uh, also known as proof texting, um, and to provide confirmation bias, you know, corresponding with the pre-held interpretation and any agenda supported by it. Uh, eisegesis is best understood when contrasted with exegesis. Exegesis is drawing out a text's meaning in accordance with the author's context and discoverable meaning. Eisegesis is when a reader imposes their interpretation of the text. Thus, exegesis tends to be objective, and eisegesis uh, tends to be highly subjective. Um, so how do we begin to exegete correctly? Context, context, context. Uh, if there's anything that we need to get out of the rest of this course, uh, is understanding our need to examine the context, context, context. <clears throat> the role of the interpreter uh, as yourself. Uh, so we need to do our best to make the meaning of scripture clear, is, is our job in interpretation. Um, yeah, as we said, the Bible is meant to be understood. It's meant, uh, yeah, we should be able to understand it. The writers wrote it to certain people, uh, and they were, you know, it was written to them to be able to be understood. Uh, and so we need to make sure that the meaning of scripture as we interpret it is clear, and it's not going to be ambiguous. Um, and so we're going to be learning how to exegete, uh, to do exegesis. Uh, and the need here, as we said, is to be objective. Um, but as we find in, uh, in my book, uh, Introduction to Biblical Interpretation says, no one comes to the task of understanding uh, as an objective believer. This means that we, we often approach the text in our own presuppositions, uh, you know, our own pre-understandings. Um, we're gonna be exploring that uh, a lot more in just uh, its own uh, class, but uh, yeah, so we, we have our own things that we bring to the table, whether uh, just the way the, cult, the culture that we've grown up in, the kind of family that we grew up in, uh, that maybe the kind of church that we even grew up in, or uh, the way that we the way that we view the world uh, apart from the Bible, uh, or even in the Bible, um, and so those can all affect the way that we interpret. And we need to be mindful of those things uh, as we start reading Scripture so that we're not influencing the way that we read the text. Uh, and then avoid proof texting. Uh, oh, I've got, sorry, one more thing. Uh, wonderful things in the Bible I see, most of them put there by you and me, uh, written by a Plymouth Brethren elder in Ireland. Uh, you know, things like, in my own life, I think, you know, drinking is a sin. You know, I grew up in a Mennonite uh, family culture, and, you know, even for my dad, it was, you know, drinking was a sin, playing cards was a sin. Um, you know, things that maybe, you know, are put in the Bible that aren't exactly scripturally true, um, may have some truth in with it, but are not fully uh, biblical. Um, another one that I remember just people saying, you know, God, God will never give you more than you can handle. Um, just a cliche Christian saying that we, we throw out there, maybe without thinking so much. Um, can you think of any, any other cliche Christian sayings that, or yeah, anything that might come to mind? Just using the, I can do all things through Christ, who strengthens me. Yeah. Yeah, not, yeah, kind of applying that to any and every situation. I can do all things. Any others? Well, I grew up in a, in a Baptist church, which is, even stricter than the Mennonite, I think. <laughs> you know, it's a sin to go to the movies. 
then to do anything on Sunday except the chores you had to do for the animals. You couldn't, as kids, you couldn't go play ball, that was a thing. You couldn't go fishing on Sunday. All those things, you know, where I look at it now and I think, you know, it's not, none of these are sins if you apply them to yourself in the right way. Right. You know, it's, uh, uh, my mom used to always say to me, well, don't think about you doing it, but look at the neighbors and they're going to say, you call yourself a Christian, you're out there fishing and you're out there playing ball. Hey, you know, they think nothing of it as far as, as, far as I'm concerned. It wouldn't weigh on any other. And so when I got married and was on, was with my first wife, we, uh, we used to play ball. We, on Sunday mornings, we'd be in church till 1 o'clock. 1.30 was ball, and we'd play ball all afternoon, and then 7, seven o'clock at night, be back in church again, you know? And uh, in the meantime, while we're playing ball, I had a chance to talk to people about the Lord and everything else while I'm there, you know? And uh, that's the way I grew up. So I basically got past that. Can't play ball on Sunday, can't fish on Sunday, can't run on Sunday. And, uh, you know, but you still have that leading, you know, that you're doing it. Yeah. But you're not being condemned because of it. It's funny how we let legalism or, yeah let our ideas just form into legalism yeah. and we put that and call it scriptural truth in a lot of ways um <coughs> another couple that i well at least one more that i had was you know love the sinner hate love the sinner hate the sin yeah. you know and i i think sometimes yeah whether whether it was a legalistic you know rule that we kind of put in place uh, for us or for our families or children um, or or some of these cliche sayings that we just we just kind of throw out there flippantly um, without really thinking through you know what does that actually mean where is that actually coming from in scripture is that accurate um, yeah and so <laughs> some of those things are those things that are put there wonderful things in the Bible most of them put there by you and me. Yeah. Uh, one that didn't come to my mind is that uh, the verse I'm not sure it's found, but where it says, you know, don't try and take the speck out of your, your yeah. friend's eye or your brother's eye, but deal with the log in your own eye first, you know? Because we, uh, we have to be careful of, you know, how we come across and whether we are really doing what the Lord wants or whether we're walking on our own, you know? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, no, it's, it's something even like that can be used flippantly even just as a way to, you know, hide ourselves from or distance ourselves from actual conviction or repenting yeah. of something uh, by throwing it in somebody else's face yeah. uh, when maybe their motives are fine and we need to just uh, take that lovingly and with humility. Um, one of the things we also need to avoid as we would said uh, previously was proof texting uh, and so yeah in that whole idea of eisegesis you know our role is not to read our own ideas and interpretations of the text. Uh, and with proof texting, we just mean, you know, taking s verses out of context, as we're going to be saying a lot, or uh, taking p key chunks of verses completely out of their context, you know, saying, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, uh, just, just to advance, you know, maybe your own belief or your own position. Uh, just to defend that without actually taking a look at that whole passage in its entirety and is it actually speaking to what I am trying to defend uh, and it's really easy for for pastors to fall into that um, 
if you're not careful. And uh, yeah, it's always important to, as we're gonna be discussing, you know, to discuss the context, find it out, figure it out, learn it, um, and yeah, continue. So what, what is the role of the Holy Spirit uh, in, in our interpretation? You guys have any any ideas? I know you guys have some of it in front of you, but is there kind of what comes to mind when when you think of you know how does the Holy Spirit help you interpret Scripture? Well, he he comes. He was sent to us as a comforter, as a guide, as a direct contact to the Lord Jesus Christ, and that he uh, uh, he's there to. To guard our uh, us if we're willing to let them live in our lives and, and work through our lives, then uh, he's there and, and we don't have to rely on our own interpretation because he will give us the interpretation we need mm. at the time. That's my That's your understanding, yeah. Reading of the Holy Spirit, you know? Any others? When Jesus was talking about leading the Holy Spirit, he said that he will lead you to the truth and remember the things that I have taught you to. Mm. Remembering what you already know and also leading you to a right interpretation. Mm. Yeah. Um, so we're going to be looking at. Uh, Holy Spirit is, you know, is responsible, uh, one, for giving us scripture, for um, you know, inspiring uh, other believers or other people to, to write. Um, so we give that uh, attribution to the Holy Spirit. Um, the Holy Spirit also uh, aids us in, in our reading of, of scripture and we call that uh, illumination you know as we're kind of talking about uh, the Holy Spirit convinces the reader that the Bible is true um, so without without the Holy Spirit you know as we said like we wouldn't understand scripture wouldn't be able to comprehend scripture um, because we need the Holy Spirit to uh, to be part of that and the Holy Spirit gives us that ability uh, to understand Scripture, uh, to to understand that the Bible is true, um, gives us the ability to apprehend, um, but not comprehend uh, the meaning. Um, so apprehension, not comprehension. And so what this means is, you know, the Holy Spirit isn't necessarily going to give us the meaning. Uh, of scripture. It will help us to grasp the meaning, um, but the Holy Spirit isn't going to simply give you the meaning. Um, as uh, it, yeah, and the, it leads to the conviction, you know, that enables readers to lead, uh, to embrace its meaning. It, it leads to that conviction of the truth of the word. Um, and so the Holy Spirit does not uh, inform us of scripture's meaning uh, and I think what that means is it's really easy to say well yeah you know the Holy Spirit or I think there's been there have been pastors uh, in in the past or even currently you know that would maybe say uh, yeah I did my whole sermon you know all of my studying it was I I don't consult anything else. I just rely solely on the Holy Spirit to give me God's word, or to give me the understanding, and to give you uh, this interpretation. Um, and I think when we solely rely or put our hope in the Holy Spirit, is the Holy Spirit is going to give me the meaning of this text? Uh, is really more of a form of laziness. Um, because what I mean is that, as we said, you know, the Spirit doesn't give you the meaning, uh, but if you rely solely on on the Holy Spirit for understanding, you'll end up reading, you know, into your you're going to end up reading your own ideas into it because you have nothing to to check 
those interpretations. Um, we also have a sinful part of ourselves that is also uh, fighting against, you know, the Holy Spirit, uh, and and we have to uh, be very careful not to uh, solely put our trust. Well, we have to put our trust solely in God. Um, I'm not saying something heretical. I promise. You no, know, I uh, was in the Gideon for years. I used to be the uh, chaplain for the Gideon for the board. And we'd go out and, uh, when we were putting the campaign on and, and speak in the different churches. And I can remember speaking in the Midwest Baptist Church and there was about 300 in the congregation. I had a sermon all prepared. And I got up on the platform, I opened my mouth, and I, never, I one of, spoke one of my things out of the sermon. So the Holy Spirit had just delivered a sermon just like that, what the people needed at the time, and I had nothing to do with it. Yeah, and that that's fine. Like, that happens. Uh, um, I think it's maybe not always the rule that, no, no. you know, <laughs> not every pastor can show up on Sunday and not have prepared a single thing and expect oh, oh, no. God to yeah, deliver a message for him. Uh, um, at the same time, I spoke in the Catholic Church and I preached a, a, a salvation sermon in the Catholic Church and uh, talked to a couple of people about, a couple of people in the congregation about salvation. When I get back the next Thursday night to the Gideon meeting, you're supposed to talk about the Gideons but not preach a sermon. <laughs> Yeah, don't waste any opportunity to don't preach. Don't waste any opportunities. That's my idea. Um, I think in this this idea of laziness, uh, of just solely giving it to the Holy Spirit to give us our interpretation, uh, I think inversely, Candace and I were talking about this actually just on Sunday, um, and just with, you know, probably the problem that we have with, you know, increasing, you know, technology, uh, our access to information. Um, I have an entire program on my computer called Logos that uh, allows me to access hundreds of commentaries just at the click of a button. Um, you know, I can scan through anybody's stuff as you know as quickly as I want. Uh, but I think you know you can also become lazy you just solely relying on uh, on the interpretations of others, uh, you know, whether that's through reading commentaries or listening to other people's sermons. Um, if you're not actually spending the time in the text yourself um, for, yeah, understanding interpretations, <laughs> it's, it's lazy. It is. Uh, proper interpretation starts with you digging into the scripture exploring the context, asking the Holy Spirit to help you grasp an understanding of the meaning, uh, consulting with the original text, the author, other commentaries, and even others in the body of Christ. You know, uh, the Mennonites have a interesting thing called a, they believe in a community hermeneutic, uh, meaning that, you know, as we interpret scripture and as the church understands scripture, uh, it's all it's done together uh when pastor brent uh, our, our last church together uh, he had said because it was a mennonite church that we were at a mennonite brethren church um he actually got to be part of with you know a bunch of other pastors at a conference uh he said to be part of one of these community hermeneutics where they sat down with a passage they all studied it together and they all you know started working at the interpretation and how they collectively understood uh, the meaning of the text. Uh, just an interesting way to approach that. But yeah, we need also need the church. In other words, we can't uh, create meanings just on our own. It also has to line up with what the greater body of the church believes. Uh, words and meaning. Um, yeah, so we're looking at uh, three words uh, locution, illocution, and perlocution. Um, 
Locution is simply, uh, you're probably not going to even remember these words once we're finished, um, but uh, locution meaning, you know, what the text says, uh, what is spoken or what was written. Uh, in Matthew 5.14, you know, it is written, you know, you are the light of the world. Um, just simple, you are the light of the world. It's just, you know, what... Uh, you know, those words in themselves uh, have meaning. Uh, and then the illocution, we're looking at uh, the author and what, uh, you know, identifies the, the intention the speaker or the writer has by the specific words that are used. Um, you know, as we're saying, words, words have meaning. Uh, we can't just say stuff to people and then say, well, I'm sorry you took it that way. Uh, you know, even though your words you know, your words actually have meaning. And if it means, you know, something offensive, even though if you said it non-offensively, um, sorry, but your words still have uh, meaning to them. Uh, and that needs to be taken into account. Uh, so we're looking at, you know, what, what does the author, you know, intend to accomplish? Uh, is there energy employed? Uh, is there content conveyed? Um, Maybe let's look at Matthew 5.16. Uh, you can turn your Bibles to there. Abby, could you read that for us, please? Matthew 5.16. Yes. Um, in the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So what, um, what do you think the author is uh, seeking to do? Can you read it one more time? Yeah. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good work deeds, and glorify your Father in heaven. So what do we think uh, you know, Jesus is trying to convey through, through this passage? Well, he's saying, let, let your light so shine before men that they may know your good works and that they might be able to know the Father in heaven. Uh, yeah, is he, is he trying to encourage, encourage others? Um, Definitely. Yeah. Um, is he also trying to inform them of something? Yeah, he could be informing you. Yeah. yeah, and so, you know, these are certain things, you know, we have to kind of look at, you know, what, what exactly is he trying to convey to his, to his readers? Um, what, yeah, what, what does it, what does it mean? Um, So we're also looking at uh, perlocution uh, as hearers. What uh, when you're looking at perlocution, you know what the is we're looking at what the author envisioned the outcome or the results to be. So as we are the readers, uh, you know what is that action uh, to be taken? What what is the the author trying to instruct us to now take that and do? Um, I would say in a sense, you know, we're also looking at you know, like how does that apply. Uh, so we're simply given the, the locution. We have the word, we have the Bible. Uh, we're given the locution, just the text. Uh, and now we have to take care to assess and learn 
you know, the illocution, what the author is uh, intending, and then also what the author is hoping uh, for us to now take and, and do with that. And so read the Bible, read it deeply. Uh, if you do not understand something, uh, look it up. Um, if you do not understand a word, uh, can't stress this enough, do not use the Webster's Dictionary. I made this mistake in my first sermon that I ever preached <laughs> because it was just like commonplace to ever hear a sermon and be like, well, Webster's Dictionary says this about this word. Um, and so I did. I'm like, it can't be a complete sermon without me saying Webster's Dictionary says this about this word. Um, now in my learned days, I'm saying do not use Webster's uh, to define what you are reading in the Bible. Uh, use a lexicon. Um, this one is a Hebrew lexicon to the Old Testament. Um, many of us have... Uh, actual you can access much of this stuff just on the internet and just by uh, searching uh, these kinds of things and using uh, an online lexicon um, basically a, a bible dictionary in a sense um, if you do not understand the context of a book uh, read an introduction or a survey i've got a couple here introduction just gives uh, a brief uh, background or understanding of you know, the context of the book that you're about to read, uh, the entirety of the, that book, or, um, yeah. And, and those can be very helpful. A survey will give you introductions of, like, a ton of uh, books or giving you that context. Um, if you can't uh, understand the picture or you cannot picture uh, the geographical location, distance from, or other landmarks, use a, a Bible atlas. Uh, I know... Some of my bigger Bibles actually have a few in the back. Um, usually you can also find those online and uh, just search the Bibles, whatever story that you're reading from usually, and it will show you uh, a picture of uh, what, uh, let's just see here. We're going to be looking at this anyway, so 2 Timothy Let's just take a look at my lovely program has has everything so there we go. and so have a nice uh, view of what is, yeah, of the world, um, but it also gives a ton of different, you know, all of the cities that are usually mentioned in uh, the different books, whether that's Ephesus, um, Corinth, um, yeah, uh, Troas, or Troy, yeah, consult an atlas, it's helpful, especially if you like maps. I love maps. Um, if you don't understand a topic, uh, search in a biblical encyclopedia. Uh, and if you don't understand the passage after going through doing all the steps that you're about to learn and do for exegesis, if you still don't uh, fully understand uh, the last step. Well, even if you do understand, the last step is to also consult a commentary and see what other learned scholars are saying uh, on the topic. Uh, to take a literary approach to the Bible means entering, living, and understanding its world before we move uh, beyond it to abstract meaning. Um, so we're also going to be looking at the impact of distance. So we're going to be looking at, uh, yeah, uh, you're, supposed to see it. 
you already can see it though in front of you. Uh, what do you guys think, uh, you know, we're going to be looking at the barriers and challenges that we face in interpreting scripture. Uh, what, what would you say are maybe some, some challenges that we may face uh, when trying to discover the context of scripture? Um, what are some things that maybe we are distanced from uh, to who they or to what was written? That's why I like the concordance. Yeah. Because then you got reference back other all over the place to help you interpret it. What, what's the answer? Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry about that. No, I'm good. <laughs> Hi, Bill. Yeah. Hold on for a second. Um, can you all only that one? The culture to uh, different customs that people would have, and we don't understand, like, why did they do that? What is it a symbol for something else that I'm not understanding? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cultural. Okay. Especially, yeah, we even have cultural differences. Uh, mm -hmm. Lyle, if you didn't know, uh, Josue is from Spain. Oh, yeah. Um, so, totally different world over there. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> very much so, I believe. <laughs> Closer to the to the, the Holy Land than we are, and you probably affiliate a lot more than what we would do with it. You know? I've always wanted to go to the Holy Land, but never been able to make it there. But my dad made it there, and he was he made it when he was 90 years old, and. Uh, he had, he had his birthday on the 29th of November on the Sea of Galilee in the hotel. That's cool. And it was kind of funny because uh, he got he was there for, I think it was 25 days. It was a long time. And anyhow, he had his birthday and the, the dining room had over 600 people in the dining room in the hotel. And so afterwards, they brought out a cake with 90 candles on it oh. to, to blow out, you know. And Crazy. Blew most of them out, not quite all of them. <laughs> and uh, then everybody came up and congratulated him and shook his hand, and the women hugged him and everything. And so then they wanted a speech. And so my dad was always very witty. And he says, you know, I've been thinking... King Solomon lived here years, many years ago, he said, and he had 600 wives and concubines. He said, I got to hug and kiss 600 pe uh, women tonight and didn't have to marry any of them, he says. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah, he, he was, he basically could, could come up with a wit like right now, you know. And my son's the same way. You get you uh, tell you tell something, and he'll figure out something that's you mean uh, uh, funny about it all, and he bring it up right away. Me, it takes me about a half an hour later after conversations all over with, I'll come up with something. But yeah. after it's all over with, so there's clearly a geographical difference between Definitely. here and there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. One of the ones we can, uh, it's maybe a bit obvious, is a uh, temporal distance, you know, taken from the, just the events of the Bible, whether it's all the way back to Adam, uh, to today, and, and trying to understand, you know, we are in such a different time, uh, just to begin with. Uh, you already spoke to uh, a cultural uh, impact. Uh, of distance, we were looking at, you know, the ancient Near East, um, you know, and now we're looking at a postmodern uh, Western society or of North America. Um, Josue is going to view it from his own culture, from his own still Western civilization in Europe. Um, there's still quite a quite a distance uh, in the way that we view, uh, the way that we understand how culture was was uh, had took pla taken place back then. Um, there's also geographical, uh, you know, taking place again. We said from the ancient Near East, 
uh, things have changed now, even there, you know, cities are different, uh, the landscape has been developed differently, uh, history has taken place over those places, and the geography itself has changed. Um, you know, even looking from all the way on our side of the pond, uh, over here in North America, it's, it can be difficult to, to see uh, and understand what is uh, has taken place over there and and so it's un, it's important that we understand you know even the geography of scripture because uh, it helps us to understand you know distances traveled uh, locations you know methods of traveling uh, and much else uh, that helps with the context of the passages so it's important <coughs> to even look at uh, <coughs> geography is a big one uh, and last is you know language uh, the languages that were used back then were, you know, Hebrew, uh, Aramaic, uh, Hellenistic Greek uh, is what the Bible is is written in. Um, I think even you know, even before you're looking at languages that maybe you know, ancient yeah ancient languages whether Egyptian or the Canaanites or whatever I don't know what their languages that they were they were speaking back then but. Uh, you know there is a gap uh, but scripture itself the Bible is written in Hebrew uh, taken from Arama Aramaic as well and uh, Hellenistic Greek or uh, Koine uh, Greek um, so not the same Greek once again that you know people like Lana uh, Brent's wife speaks uh, it's it's different not in its entirety but definitely in the way many of, much of it is uh, phrased uh, yeah, and then taking that largely to our translations now, uh, if those of us who can't uh, speak uh, one of the original languages, um, we are left with our own translations, whether that's in English or in Josue's case in Spanish. Um, in English, we are fortunate to have a m massive variety of, of translations, but uh, with that being said, uh, if we can't read the original languages uh, or do not have the ability to like take a course and to learn those languages, um, we need to be mindful of the, the translations that we're using and the differences uh, that, that they can have, the, maybe some of the benefits and maybe some of the downfalls, um, but just to be mindful, not that anyone is particularly horrible. Um, we'll be speaking a little bit more towards that, but yeah, to be mindful. Um, proper biblical interpretation uh, is needed because the Bible was originally written you know, to someone else uh, who lived a long time ago across the world speaking another language had different cultural values you know it's so vastly different from us that it's amazing that we try uh, to read into the scripture and and feel like we can instantly understand yes that is what they are speaking to head coverings on worship what were they thinking paul was a sexist you know we need to be careful the way we interpret that because yeah much of these stories much of these letters that are written are letters to people that weren't us you know across an entire different culture and time uh, ago so I wanted to take a few minutes and uh, do a little exercise uh, through 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 to 13 and 21. Um, and so we wanted to start asking these questions, you know, what are the questions that we could be asking uh, of, you know, impact of distance? Uh, what, you know, what are the different temporal, cultural, geographical, language questions that we can be asking uh, to help us understand or maybe we don't understand and maybe we can uh, ask some of these questions. So, once you've read the passage, maybe we you can just discuss it with each other for a little bit and then we'll talk to it together.
Get, uh, maybe what what are yeah some of the questions that you may have uh, regarding this passage why do we need to know about his cloak oh interesting yeah <laughs> why do we need to, why do we need to know about his cloak that he asks for. go get his cloak well, I think his, his cloak is because he was in prison and he was probably cold, and he wanted his, his cloak that he left somewhere uh, late, earlier on because it was warm and he didn't want to take it with him, and now he's, he's asking them to bring him because he's freezing cold. I think that's probably what he meant by bringing his coat, cloak. Left it with somebody, so maybe somebody else was borrowing his, his yeah. coat for him for a bit. Yeah. Any other questions? I think he was... Uh, at the end of his ministry, yeah, I think that he was um, uh, prepared to die, right? And uh, he uh, was saying that you know, you know, don't judge people for what they're doing to me, but you know, preach the word to them and carry on. That's what I think he was trying to prove right. to break. So, so first we're, we're asking that question, who's writing this, who's writing this letter to, to Timothy? Well, yeah, we have to answer that with Paul. And yep. then second of all, as, you know, as Paul's writing this, you know, what, what is happening with Paul? What is surrounding this, you know, this maybe this desperate, uh, this urgency or why, you know, why is Paul being so urgent in his letter writing? else? Other questions? I think going on to say that the time comes when people will seek other false prophets rather than the truth and to, he's saying to stay firm to the, to the gospel. Um, sort of cautioning people that, uh, you know, he isn't going to be around to, to direct them in the next 
a little while, so basically they've got to start interpreting it yourself. Um, yeah, uh, part of those questions that we need to be asking is, you know, even like where where is Paul while he's writing this? Um, I personally believe that he was in jail. Yeah, so he was in jail, but where? <laughs> in Rome. In Rome. Yeah. Um, you know, and why, why is he, uh, you know, Paul writes to him, or to Timothy, you know, come see me. Uh, and then later, even in verse 21, he says, you know, make sure you get here before winter. Um, you know, why, why before winter? Why is that important? Why does he, he need wants to? His coat. Yeah, why, why does he need to? <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe you answered the question right there. <laughs> Bring my cloak. Get here before winter. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna get cold. <laughs> um, you know, as you know, as we're reading here, there's a whole bunch of uh, from verse nine to to thirteen. There's a ton of different geographical locations that are mentioned. Um, you know, he's instructing, you know, telling Timothy about this guy named Demas, who has decided he liked the world better, and so he left left Paul and in Rome over here, and he decided to go up to Thessaloniki, which is uh, up here uh, towards Macedonia. Um, and then, you know, Crescens has gone to Galatia. Uh, Galatia is... I believe, oh, yellow? Yeah, Galatia. Yeah, up in this area. Um, and then even, um, who is it? Titus went to Dalmatia. So Titus went, you know, he's hanging up here in Dalmatia. Uh, and, and it's believed by most scholars that uh, Paul is writing to Timothy, who is at this time in Ephesus. And so, uh, from Rome, is Ephesus is down here in this part of Asia. Uh, so, yeah, he's saying come quickly. Uh, it's a long travel. You know, we're looking. We've either got ship or by foot. Uh, might get lucky with a horse and a cart, but probably not. Um, so he's saying like it's a long journey to get there. Uh, generally, either uh, you could sail around this way and across uh, or there was a the Roman road which actually took uh, came up here and straight across from Thracia to Macedonia and then it was just a little hop across but either way we're looking at many many miles of travel in you know not our current world where it's easy to just hop on a plane and fly across so he's saying you know you need to get here quickly one because my the end of my time is pretty close like they're probably going to kill me soon yeah. um so please get here urgently so that you're not going to be late uh come quickly because and before winter because if you try to set sail uh, in the winter time there's going to be rougher seas it's going to be much more dangerous you're probably not going to be sailing uh and you're not going to make it in time um yeah and so all of these things are yeah, and I need my cloak. <laughs> so, uh, they're all questions where we need to maybe not necessarily start looking at the text and saying, well, this is what's going on, but we need to ask the questions first and come up with a list of questions. Why is this happening? Who is writing it? Why are they writing it to this person? What is the importance of this person? Why, who is Timothy? Why is he important to Paul's ministry? Um, yeah, all of these things are important because as we look at it, you know, we're not just starting to read, if we just start reading 2 Timothy uh, and we start reading what Paul is saying, we're thinking maybe he's writing this, like maybe is he writing this to a group of people? Like if we don't start with the basics and understand the whole foundation of it, the whole context of it, uh, it's really easy to get lost in proof texting and saying, you know, well, uh, get somebody to bring me a cloak. You know, that's scripture. <laughs> Tell
tell so and so to bring me my cloak. You know, I don't know. Like, uh, it's really easy to just pick picks and pick and choose stuff if we don't uh, take a look at the whole context. True interpretation of the Bible combines both an exercise in ancient history and a grappling with its impact on our lives. Indeed, to understand fully what a text meant to its original recipients requires that we grasp something of that original impact ourselves to the extent that we are able. Um, so, let's see, where is our... And so what we have learned applies to our lives today. God has a lot to say in his book. You see, we know that God's word is for everyone. Now that our soul is done, we'll take the look. Did you ever watch Veggie Tales? <laughs> I just started uh, listening to all the songs again from as a kid. And I was like, you know what? I really appreciated this point of the end of each episode of, well, let's talk about what we've learned today. Um, so in conclusion, uh, you know, we're looking at this need for interpretation. Uh, we need uh, to learn how to interpret in order to discern uh, God's message. You know, what did God intend to communicate to us? Um, as we said, you know, avoid scriptural abuse through proof texting. Do not use individual texts out of context uh, simply to prove your viewpoint. That's that whole idea of eisegesis versus exegesis. Exegesis is good. Eisegesis is bad. Um, we also need to uh, learn how to interpret so that we can avoid uh, or dispel misconceptions or erroneous perspectives and conclusions about what the Bible teaches. Um, as I said, you know, implementing correct interpretive methods helps you <laughs> sound the alarm in a way uh, as you're learning this, as you're developing this. Uh, when other people say something that, you know, might be a little cliche or, uh, you know, it's maybe not scripturally sound, you know, there should be alarm bells going off in your head and you can be able, you should be able to uh, then challenge that uh, or encourage that person. Um, uh, Candace tells me now, she goes to a women's Bible study every Wednesday and she's told me, she's like, David, you've ruined me. Uh, I can't sit through a Bible study without, you know, trying to challenge the other women. I'm like, well, what's the context, you know? Because it's really easy to just kind of say what you feel, you know, the passage is telling you. Um, but, but yeah, it is something where if just because it's what you think or what you feel that it means, doesn't mean that that is the case of what uh, actually is supposed to be uh, saying. And so, yeah, we can challenge each other in our own Bible studies uh, in church, you know, whether that's listening to the sermon you should be able to pick up if your pastor is uh, maybe read something a little incorrectly and challenge him on it because it's not a horrible thing to have a humble pastor that can take some correction. And we're just, you know, as I'm learning, I am just a person just like the rest of you. And I don't always get it right either. And, and so as pastors, you know, we need to hear that and... Uh, yeah, we need to be kept to that uh, standard of, of correct biblical interpretation. And so, yeah, and then this also helps us to, uh, as we'll find out later, to be able to apply the Bible's message to our lives. Um, always make space for God to speak uh, and teach uh, whenever studying Scripture. It's really easy to become so focused on the context uh, and the passage that we will fail to remember, uh, you know, that this is God's word, uh, that this is him speaking to us and into our lives, that it was written for us. Um, it's also really easy uh, when we get caught up in exegeting in context to just become uh, a walking database for ancient facts. Um, we don't want to 
we want to move beyond just understanding the context. Uh, the meaning has to come first before the context. It's really easy to put that first. Um, and so the goal is to correctly interpret the meaning of the text, you know, so that you can communicate God's love to others, and so that we can share his word to the world. Uh, so we must always understand that even though the Bible was written by human hands, it is ultimately God's word. Uh, we must take care to keep in perspective the eternal implications of the text, in seeking to understand God's message to his people. That is all. Is there any questions or comments further? Lyle's always got something to say.